Tonight's telecast of the 1988 Sports Star of the Year Awards is brought to you by Caltex. The bicentennial year is over, but we look back on a year when sport played a major part in the nation's celebrations of our 200th birthday. We also look back on a year of achievement in South Australian sport as we meet the top 12 women and men in the 1988 Caltex Sports Star of the Year Awards. Our host for tonight, Tony Charlton. The Caltex Sports Star of the Year Awards in close association with the news and for Australia's bicentennial year. It's nice to be here. It's always a grand occasion and made the better through television making it accessible to so many. As time brings its changes, it is nice, I think, to feel the security of an event which has maintained its standards and done a remarkable job for sport and the sporting community. And like old Father Thames, keeps rolling along. The Caltex and the News, Sports Star of the Year. Our guest of honour this year is one of the most gifted of cricketers. And he is escorted on stage by another of similar vein, the state captain, David Hooks. Would you please welcome our guest of honour, Mr Barry Richards. When he appeared at the Adelaide Oval for the Les Favel testimonial match, Barry Richards returned to the field which was his home ground for one season of Sheffield Shield cricket in 1970-71. After only four test appearances for his native South Africa, Barry Richards stamped his authority on an Australian Shield season. His 356 against Western Australia at the WACA ground will long be remembered, as will his average of over 100. David Hooks's career spans a much longer period, but his batting for South Australia has included many sparkling moments. David will be remembered for his successive Shield centuries, his batting against Tony Gregg in the Centenary Test, and a bouncer in World Series cricket, the last time he batted against the Quicks without a helmet. Well, how long did it take you to recover from that? Some say you still haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the commentator shall remain nameless, believes that. <laughs> yeah, a nasty moment, and uh, you've been critical of, um, of that type of bowling. Do you think it's any the less now than it was then? No, I don't think so, Tony. I think that uh, when Australia wins, uh, everybody's happy for that short sort of bowling when we had Lillian Thompson. I think the hue and cry is basically a result of uh, four great West Indian fast bowlers over the last ten years uh, in different permutations causing havoc. Barry, welcome, and what is your assessment of the local Australian scene 18 years on since living here before? I guess, Johnny, the, uh, the one thing that sticks out most is the one-day cricket and the promotion of cricket. I think uh, since Kerry Pack has been around and, and television, the promotion of cricket has just been fantastic, and I think it's taken it into a lot of households that wouldn't normally watch cricket. And can I ask you for your philosophy on coaching in cricket? Yeah, I, th I think it depends on what level you're at. I mean, there's obviously basic coaching where you, you do the technique and that sort of thing with, with the younger kids, and then you get it right up until, you know, Bob Simpson with the, with the Australian side. And, yeah, I think there's a bit of psychology and a bit of coaching. The chaps have a little bit of deficiencies and techniques which you can help them with and, and work on. And I think, uh, basically, it's, it's just boosting confidence in a lot of cases because fellows need that extra little bit of confidence when they go into combat. Would you agree with that? Well, yes and no. I, I mean, we play in Sydney next week and he uh, spent an hour with me this afternoon trying to get me to bowl like <laughs> Alan Border. So. <laughs> and, and if I can bowl that much rubbish and get that many wickets, I'll be more than pleased. <laughs> and so will I. <laughs> A lovely exchange. Now, David, uh, after Sydney, um, are we doctoring pictures like we say others do? <laughs> No, we're not. I think Sydney traditionally in the last 15 years has played as it has and uh, I think if we were doctoring pitches, Tony, we would have played the first test in Sydney to go one up in the series against the West Indies, played the second test in Adelaide to get a draw and be one up after two and then force the issue back on the West Indies. I mean, that's what I would have done. Uh, and <laughs> yet they allowed them to go 3-0 up. Well, that sounds good, but uh, Viv Richards doesn't agree. But Barry Richards does. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be the logical way to go, and I mean, I think it would uh, create a lot of a lot of interest as well, Tony. I think you know, doctoring of pitches. Well, I mean, that's been going on since Jim Laker took 19, 19 wickets in a Test match. I think it's gone on 
forever and a day, and it's just that television's around now, and so you, you found out a little bit more often than you were in the past. Finally, and uh, on a, a pretty sad note, can I ask you for your reaction to the bar by the ICC on South Africa? Obviously disappointing. I think, you know, uh, you know South Africa is a very emotional issue, and a lot of people talk at length about it, and uh, it could go on for, for uh, a three-hour debate, which I wouldn't like to do. But I think the saddest part of the whole thing is, is feeling sorry for a chap like Ali Bach, who is very committed to multiracial cricket. And uh, I think he's the person who most would be devastated by the ruling that, that's come out. Because I think more than anybody, he wants to see cricket normalised. He's a, a real traditionalist at heart and would love to see them playing in traditional cricket. But again, he has to provide the incentive for the young players. I mean, if you've got a Mark Valletta or a Tom Moody or a Darren Lehman who wants to play for Australia, you've got to provide that incentive for these young players. And, um, you know, much as he, he doesn't want to go the rebel route, I, I fear that that might happen again. Barry Richards, a man whose skills were really denied to the cricketing world in terms of test cricket. He only played four test matches and averaged something like 70. He was our guest of honour and he was joined by a more than competent David Hooks. Thank you. Sports Star of the Year presentations and to be made of course by guest of honour Barry Richards. Kicking a goal to start our parade, the fairest and most brilliant footballer of the year, Greg Whittlesey. Greg Whittlesey, the quiet achiever from Yankalilla. He enjoyed fantastic success in 1988. Captain of the Sturt Footy Club, he played a major role in their resurgence. He did more than his share helping South Australia to win the Bicentennial Footy Carnival in Adelaide and to cap things off very nicely, was a thoroughly deserving winner of the McGarry Medal. He also proved to be something of a dab hand at celebrating that win. <laughs> so the Sturt uh, centre man polled 28 votes, 10 clear. Terrific, wasn't it? Yes, it was a good feeling. Thinking back on it, I, you know, I was pretty hectic uh, celebrations and afterwards, but uh, I've come down to earth pretty well now and I'm looking forward to uh, getting back on the track and playing footy again. And you got a bonus because South Australia really walloped Victoria. Oh yeah, that's, uh, it was a great uh, carnival uh, in March last year, but uh, we've got um, you know, a game uh, in Victoria this year, which uh, I think everybody here will be looking forward to. It's been a long time since we played over there, so uh, I think that'll be the icing on the cake if we beat them over there, I think. Greg, what change in the order of things might we expect in the league this year? Uh, I think, well, last year was a very even competition, um, you know. Uh, there's, uh, there were six, seven really good sides and anybody could have played in the finals and I think it's even going to get tighter this year and uh, there's going to be, uh, you know, uh, Norwood, the Ports, uh, Glen Elds, they've been around for a long time but uh, everybody wants to knock them off and, um, you know, and all play in the finals. I think uh, looking forward to it. Now Sturt will be seeking a premiership of course but you've already got one of those in the under-17s. Yeah, that's right. It was uh, a few years ago now but it's one thing I'm striving for in, you know, in league company now. Uh, um, you know, I've played state footy, which is a great, uh, you know, uh, for the competition, but uh, uh, out of Sturt, it's, um, it's one thing I, don't, I haven't done in, in league, and it'd be good just holding up a cup uh, at, at the end of the year for, yeah. for all the work you put into it. Now, you've signed up on the retention scheme, which is effectively checkmated Richmond, and uh, in your idle time, you're a farm hand at a cattle stud in the Adelaide Hills. That's right. Um, I made a big decision last year to um, stay here in South Australia. Um, the tension scheme came in and uh, really gave me an option to think about. And uh, what happened last year, well, it, was, it was great. I can't ask for anything more. And uh, I'm happy. Uh, I'm a country boy at heart. And uh, <laughs> uh, the rural side is something that I, you know, had, I thought about too. And uh, but. Um, uh, that's good, and I, I love playing here. It's good competition. And Max Bashir is all smiles. Congratulations to you, Greg Whittlesey. Well done. Thanks, Barry. Barry Richards for the presentation. For the Footballer of the Year, Greg Whittlesey. Very well deserved. Caltex and the News present the celebrated South Australian shooter, Libby Kosmala. 
There is only one person in Australia who can hold up three gold medals collected in Seoul. Top Gun, Libby Kosmala. Libby dominated the air weapons events at the Paralympics, taking the air rifle, prone and kneeling positions, plus the overall medal. She is, without argument, the best exponent of her chosen discipline in the world. On a high still, I'll bet, and Stan too. That's right, yes we are. Coming, both coming back with gold, it was wonderful. Yeah, tell us about Stan. Yes, Stan got a gold in the pears, lawn bowls, my husband, Stan, and he, um, he was most ecstatic about it. And we did it on the same day at the same time. Yeah, fantastic. It was. Now, to you. Have you shot any better since getting home? Yes, much better. <laughs> I might have come back with a four gold if I'd shot as well as I've shot since I've returned home. Yeah. Um, I've shot with the able-bodied people in um, competition and um, come out with a 389 out of 400 in the standing position and shooting, yeah. which is really good. That's absolutely fantastic. Ambitions remaining, if any? Oh, yes, I'm still going to keep in there. I'm going to start training up some of my younger wheelchair shooters and get them up to international standards. So we've got a women's team over there in the international competition next Great. time. I didn't ask you, how did you go on the state titles last weekend? Oh, we had a wonderful time. Um, I did win a few events, yes, quite a few events. Any records? No records, no, but um, came home with five trophies. Yeah, well, you've been an absolute inspiration to so many and you are the number one in the world and we compliment you, Libby Kosmala. Thank you. and persistence personified. She's remarkable. A special award is inaugurated this year and will be given tonight in recognition of service to sport. The management of Caltex and the news have considered the many sports persons who have dedicated their lives to sport, such as coaches and administrators, who are essential to enable the sports stars to emerge. And they and their wisdom have elected the outstanding cycling coach, Charlie Walsh. won 59 state titles as amateur and pro. He won the Austral and the Melbourne Cup on wheels. I think one and only one rider in the past has done that. And of course, he has been just exemplary in what he's done in terms of his coaching and is of international renown. However, this great moment for Charlie is perhaps diluted a bit because of his decision not to accept reappointment as national coach. Well, that's a decision I've taken with some consideration. But it's taken in, in terms of the best interests of our athletes, that's what I believe in, and I believe in it very strongly. And the sport belongs to our athletes and it belongs to all the people in Australia, and that's why I've done it. Charlie, it's a bit deeper than that. I think many of the athletes would be disappointed. You say you've suffered an unacceptable lack of support from the Australian Cycling Federation. Well, it's one of those things I don't really like to go into in, in great depth. <clears throat> We're the uh, second best country in the world in track cycling. We want to go a little bit further, and I see that's just a matter of professionalising our operation. Well, two silver and two bronze at the Olympics, that was the best effort by an Australian team at the Games. I was very proud of the effort by, by our boys, in fact, of the group that we had here that were trained in South Australia, and it's a South Australian product that we did put on, the, put on that track. <clears throat> and that's something I must say our Premier had uh, good perception. He recognised cycling as being a, a valuable sport, and uh, he worked very hard with us to have the Australian Institute of Sport based here with our uh, South Australian operation. That's been an integral part of our success. And the worst performance we actually came up with was fourth place at the Games. So that was a tribute to, uh, to our cyclists and to the program we've developed here in South Australia. It would be of satisfaction to you, not only winning the award, but being held and knowing you are in such respect, not only within Australian cycling, but uh, in broader fields. We are delighted that you are the inaugural winner of the Caltex and News Service to Sport Award Charlie Walsh. Thank you, I'm very proud. More of the current sports stars to meet after meeting these commitments.
As Charlie Walsh would testify, we've always produced remarkable cyclists, and he's been a part in that. We are now to honour one of the best of them, and he is represented by one of the best of them. Coming on stage now is Mike Turter for Dean Woods. Dean Woods has finished his medal collecting. He pulled the curtain down on a sensational amateur career to test himself against the world's best in the toughest school of them all, the professional cycling circuit in Europe. He goes to the money market with the best credentials possible. Olympic gold in Los Angeles, Olympic silver and bronze in Seoul. Mike, what was the most critical part of that 4,000 metre pursuit race? What made the difference between silver and gold? Hmm, it's a hard question to answer, but um, I suppose the hardest race for Dean was the semi-final against the East German. Um, when you take in consideration that he actually split the two superpowers in the, in the world of cycling, Russia and East Germany, um, I think the semi-final was the race that really meant the most to Dean to get into the final. So if you're right, and I assume you are, he would know that, and you mean he exhausted himself in that effort? Well, the rider that he raced in the semi-final uh, by the name of Dittert from East Germany was a very un unpredictable rider. Um, so he had to establish a lead early in the race, which he did, and uh, he really pressurised him all the way, because the East German was known to be a very fast finisher. So. Dean had to use a lot of energy in that semi-final race and bearing in mind the uh, controversy before the event uh, with the, the Davis issue, so it was a great effort. Yes, I know what you're talking about now. Has the boy uh, reached his potential or is there more there? Well, he's only young, I sp and 23 years of age, so he's got a lot, a lot, uh, lot to go, but he's turned to road racing now and he's currently in Europe where he's uh, taken a contract with a uh, West German team and um, his track record is... Uh, exceptional and now he's got to prove himself on the road. Where do you class him in your experience? Without any doubt he's the best pursuit track rider ever produced in this country and uh, maybe two or three years down the track he may become a world professional road champion, who knows. Lovely to hear somebody of such qualification talking so grandly about him. Mike Turter for Dean Woods. Thank, Thank you. you. The next Caltech's and Muse champion is also overseas at the moment, so he will be represented by his mother, Liz. I'm talking of that outstanding tennis prospect, Darren Cale. South Australians have played a huge role in Australian men's tennis, and Darren Cale provided one of the big highlights. His performance at the US Open in beating Boris Becker in straight sets on his way to the last four. Another notable casualty of the noted Cale will to win was Pat Cash at the Stella Artois tournament in England. Killer has a fine doubles record too. He's a fine boy and I've been with him more recently than his mother has because we had quite a conversation at uh, the National Tennis Centre in Melbourne over the weekend. Right, I, I was there too. Oh, you were there too? <laughs> <laughs> well, then I haven't seen... I didn't know you were there. I wish I had known. Well, uh, let's talk about the Australian Open. Um, pretty uh, hard effort, but he hasn't quite been able to reproduce the form that he showed in the US Open. No, um, I think he's, he's on the way back now. He's just sort of showing some of those signs. Yeah, and what news from Vienna and what do you believe are the prospects there and will he play singles and will Cash play? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I, I got a call this morning at one o'clock in the morning when I was in Melbourne and uh, he just missed his connecting flight uh, to Vienna, he was in Rome by three minutes, so he wasn't very happy. No. So um, he'd already been in Rome for six hours, so he decided to ring home to see. <laughs> to I'm going to put this to you: he's over tennised. He was, I'd say, um, but I feel that now he's on the way back. But I'd say he was over tennised at the end of the year. Now, despite the ruckus with Cash in Melbourne, my understanding is that the boys feel they've got a really good chance. Yes, I, I, I do believe. You know, they do feel very confident. Yeah, well, I hope he sees it through, and so do you, of course. Yes. <laughs> uh, gosh, the, uh, such a litany of achievement. Uh, defeated reigning champion Pat Cash in the Wimbledon warm-up event. He beat Boris Becker in the US Open. He became the first Australian in four years to reach the US semi-finals and the first unseeded player since 1970. That's right. Yeah, you must be proud of him. Very proud. And you and John, too. Thank you, Liz, Thank very you much very indeed. Much. Thank you For Darren Cale, there's his mother. Ladies and gentlemen, the only South Australian member of our Olympic track and field team, Lisa Martin.
Lisa Martin is a superior athlete. She's had a remarkable career, beginning as a schoolgirl hurdler in Gawler. Her most recent achievement was to take the silver medal at the Seoul Olympics, the first Australian to win a medal in an Olympic marathon. Lisa also survived the celebrity race at the Adelaide Grand Prix. <laughs> Did you like that? <laughs> I didn't star in it, I was in it, but I was somewhere near the rear. <laughs> I'd like you to know that I survived a plane trip from Melbourne today because she was in a mini skirt and we happened to be sitting together. <laughs> And we did not account for there, but we should hear that in the Bay to Breakers, you were in ahead of 75,000 runners. That's correct. It's the largest road race in the world, and I've run it three years in a row. I finished third the first year, second the second year, and I won it the first year, so I'm going to stop with that record, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and in the uh, Sydney to Surf, uh, you had spectacular success there, and in fact, you broke Alison Rowe's record. Mm -hmm. Alison Rowe set a record in the City Surf when she went on to set a world record in the marathon, and I broke her record in the city surf by almost two minutes so that was a really good indication to me that I do well in the Olympics and it was great to have a race in Australia. Now you've already declared very clearly that uh, silver medal wasn't good enough for you <laughs> and it's going to be Barcelona for the gold. I think when you lose a gold medal by 13 seconds it's all the motivation that I need to keep going for another four years so I'm really looking forward to Barcelona and Someone just mentioned to me that perhaps if Melbourne got the 1996 Olympics, I shouldn't be allowed to retire after 92, so I could be around for a while. Well, we'd all be in favour of that. <laughs> Lisa, you told me that uh, Robert D. Costello and Gaylene were living in your house in Phoenix at the moment, and you've been training together. Mm -hmm. Rob came to Phoenix because it was snowing in Boulder, Colorado, where they live at this time of year, and we started running about 200 kilometres a week together. Gaylene couldn't come at first because she's just got pregnant again. She wasn't feeling too well, so she sent a Christmas cake and a large tin of biscuits, which we ate, <laughs> and we both gained five pounds, so then we decided we'd go on a diet together, and I helped Rob by eating all the chocolate in the house, so then I had seven pounds to lose. <laughs> but we're both training really well. He's still in Phoenix, and I'm based in Canberra now, training for London Marathon on April 23rd. Oh, you're going to run at the London Marathon? Yes. Mm -hmm. Was that programmed? I didn't know that. I chose London a few months ago because it's a fast course, and I hope to go close to a world record. Will Deke run it then? Steve Monaghetti is running it, and I, if Rob is fit, he plans to run it too, and I believe that it will probably be telecast in Australia, so it will well, be a great race so. for Australia to watch. He told me that two marathons, the Premier would agree, is all <laughs> the body can stand in a year. Do you agree? I agree. <laughs> I've been limiting myself to two a year because I hope to run for probably another six or eight years. Well, that would delight us and all the fashion plates around the various cities of the world, wouldn't it? Um, Marvellous achievement during the year by Lisa Martin. NWS 9 and regional stations throughout the state are taking the telecast of the Caltex and News Sports Star of the Year and we embrace this time around the Imparja uh, network out of Alice Springs. So we're going as far north, I would assume, as Newcastle Waters and as far southwest as Ayers Rock and Eulara. Hello to uh, Pete Severin at Curtin Springs and all of our friends there. The Sports Star of the Year continues after this break. the second year, the Junior Sports Star, an award of recognition and encouragement to the best junior. And I ask Neil Hawke, so much identified with sporting skills and human courage um, unbounded, to please come forward and announce the Junior Sports Star. Thank you, Tony. Well, 12 months ago, the news and Caltex in their wisdom uh, decided to introduce a Junior Pathfinder Award. Uh, the quality of those that qualified being under the age of 18 as at the 31st of December was excellent. They have continued with that this year and I'm sure that the people that will be nominated will go ahead in the years to come 
and make us even more proud than we are now. They've been nominated by their respective associations. Um, the first in alphabetical order, I hope so, uh, Joanne Fall. Joanne is ranked number two in the world in junior tennis and she shares top spot with New South Wales Rachel McQuillan in the doubles. She is now making inroads into the major competitions around the world and in time will become a major force at the higher level. Phil Rogers, a swimmer, won gold in the 100 and 200 metres breaststroke in the 16 year old age group at the national titles in Brisbane. Jason Ziller, he commenced last season with West Towns in the under 17s and at the end of the season had played two league matches. In between times he starred in the under 17 Teal Cup in Canberra. Let's hope he stars with West Torrens. <laughs> <laughs> this year, and let's hope we keep some of those Victorians away, like Dean Woods, who is on a, a mission over here signing our footballers under the guise of being a cyclist. <laughs> And our fourth nomination is Tanya Van Heer, who competed in the national championships in Perth, won the 100, 200 and 400 metre titles and was the anchor runner in the successful relay team. I have an envelope. I can remember Gub Gubby Allen once being asked if he had the envelope. He said no, and pandemonium set in. But <laughs> we'll do a little better tonight. Well, from a great, very great South Australian sporting family, we're going to hear a lot more of Joanne Fall. I sincerely hope you have your birth certificate. <laughs> yeah. You're 21. <laughs> would you convey a... Would you convey a warmest congratulations? I That's lovely. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm very proud to accept the award on behalf of Joanne <clears throat> and I'd like to thank the South Australian Tennis Association for nominating her for the award and I'd also feel sure she'd like to thank all her coaches at the Institute of Sport in Canberra and also anyone who's helped her in the past in South Australia, there are lots of people and I know she's doing her very best to uh, carry on with the game and um, you can be sure that she's trying her hardest all the time. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. A proud mother for Joanne Fall, winner of the Junior Pathfinder Award in the Caltex and New Sports Star of the Year series, being presented from the Festival Centre and live on this NWS 9 and regional stations. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, at 17, the youngest archer ever to represent Australia in Olympic competition, Represented by his father, Rob, I'm talking of Simon Fairweather. Simon Fairweather is not a household name, but in the sport of archery, he is someone special. The youngest Australian to represent at Olympic level, Simon trains in rural splendour at Strathalban, and that must be of some value. 
He's captured the Open national title twice and broke three Australian records to win Olympic selection. He was also awarded the trophy for best all-round performance at the national championships. Well, he has the national championships and he shattered three Australian records. Four. Four, was it? Four. The uh, single feeder, the double feeder, the 90 and the 70 metre. And all this new technology, he had bazookas and slide rules and wind gauges on that thing. Tell us about what... Oh, we're one well up on, this, on the sailors, I think. Uh, we've thrown Kevlar out uh, a couple of years back now. We're on to fast flight. It's a, a pre-stressed polyethylene and it has a life of something like 5,000 times that of, that of Kevlar. So um, it makes the uh, arrows come out a lot faster. Right. And what degree of accuracy can these international guys now achieve? Well, the world record uh, for 30 metres, for instance, is um, 357. Um, the arrows, that means that all bar three, need to fall within that zone from 30 metres. Simon shot on Monday at 356. It will give you an idea of the level of shooting that he's reached. Doesn't surprise us at all that he's won one of these awards. Thank you, Father, right. for representing him. Thank you. And give, give him all the best. He's in Canberra, right? That's right. Yeah. Yes, he just won the ACT championships. Just won the ACT. Well done. <laughs> Making the final 12, another vote for tennis. For reaching the French Open doubles final, John Fitzgerald, represented by Bruce Nesbitt. There aren't too many career opportunities in Coccolici, so John Fitzgerald picked the right option when he decided to play for pay on the world tennis circuit. In singles, Fitzy beat Lendl on the way to the US Pro Indoor Final, and in doubles with Anders Yarrod, he made the finals at Wimbledon and the French Open. He's had no trouble paying the bills this year. No disgrace in getting to do Grand Slam finals. What a pity he couldn't just win a couple of them. That's right. That'd be fantastic if he could, wouldn't it? I feel that uh, John's done a wonderful job the last couple of years. Had that bad shoulder injury and he's come back and uh, got to the, uh, well, the top 25 in the ATP rankings today. And uh, I feel that he's chasing the Davis Cup with another couple of South Australians. It'd be great if he could uh, take that out. Well, I didn't know of the ATP ranking, but if mm. that's right and you would know, then mm. he's the leading Australian player. He was on these, these rankings, but I was talking to Ray Woodford tonight and Ray said he got some that are a bit later and he thinks that Mark's down to number 13, so <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it's a pretty close uh, call. This mad age of yes, computers and things. that's right. right. Now, you used to coach him from the time he came to Adelaide from Coccolici. That's right. Mm. Now, what's he uh, saying about the uh, Davis Cup? Have you heard anything? Not very much. They're having a bit of a problem with courts at present, but we haven't been able to get in touch with him. He shot off after the doubles in Melbourne, and... Uh, He's been practicing over there, but they're not sure whether they're going to be playing Davis Cup on uh, the Ondon car or whether they're going to go on a hard court. Mm. So it's a bit up in the air at present. Now, Bruce, I'm not forgetting his defeat of Lendl in the US Pro Indoor mm. about a year ago. That has to be his best effort. I think so, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, he's come back very well. His dedication and determination is fantastic. He's uh, a type of young man that's been on the circuit now for probably 10 years. and. Uh, a wife and a kitty to look after, and he's after a bit of money too, <laughs> to keep things going. But uh, he's done particularly well, and we're very proud of him anyway. Yes, Bruce Nesbitt, former coach of John Fitzgerald. Thank you, Tony. This young lady returned from the World Championships with the ranking of number one. I'm speaking of trampolinist Liz Jensen. More bounce to the ounce. Trampolinist Liz Jensen has had plenty of career highs and is the dominant figure in her chosen sport. A high-profile athlete in a sport that struggles for recognition. Competing in the Victorian Championships, Liz picked up six gold medals. She also broke two world records and equaled another. I don't know why uh, they're struggling with you around. <laughs> and you're the Australian captain? Yes. Yeah, That's good right. girl. Now, when are the World Games? That's the next thing. Uh, the World Games um, are in July this year in Germany. So you're uh, probably getting all set for that right now? Yeah, training hard for yeah. that. How will you go? I should do well. <laughs> will you win it? Um, hopefully, <laughs> yeah. but I don't know. It just depends who's going. But you have to be favourite. Um, Not I necessarily? Don't... Not necessarily, no. Well, it was probably an unfair question to ask. Yeah. <laughs> How? Do you do these three types of triples, which uh, now you have in your routine? Um, 
Well, the first one that I've been doing for about oh, maybe six or seven years is um, just a triple somersault from my back around to my back. Um, and then I learnt... Well, I've been doing this other one for <laughs> about five years, but I've only just started putting it in a routine. And that's a triple somersault from my feet to my feet again, but with You're a You're saying it's taken twist. five years to get it to a standard that was right? Um, well, I could do it before, but I was always too busy working on other stuff to put in my routines. And the third one? Um, the third one is a triple somersault from my feet to my feet with a half twist, but with my legs straight. You all understand that? <laughs> <laughs> what are you hoping most to achieve, Liz? Um, I'd like to keep on doing trampolining until it gets in the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> you might have a long wait. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> well, you're not disheartened, are you? And no. I tell you what, you do stand a good chance, even though you feel apprehensive about it. The World Games, we're with you, OK? Thank you. Congratulations on winning another Caltech Silver Special. <laughs> the breaker of two world records, and she has also equaled a world record, Liz Jensen, in the Sports Star of the Year. In the Caltex in the news, Sports Star of the Year, a member of our gold medal Olympic uh, hockey team, Sandy Pisani. 1988 was Sandy Pisani's dream year. After the disappointment of Los Angeles, the years of sweat and endeavour paid off in Seoul when the Australians defeated Korea in the Olympic final. Sandy was the only South Australian athlete to bring home a gold medal. She is a great athlete and one of the great characters in Australian sport. And we'd all agree with that. Now, you're taking a bit of a break now, but will you come back for the state championships in May? I don't know if the state coach is watching, so I haven't been out to training yet, but <laughs> I actually, um, I have been having a bit of a break and uh, I've enjoyed it, but uh, I've missed it a little bit, just the companionship of the girls, so I think I'll be out on the track soon. And the sweetness of the memory, still as profound? Yes, um, I think everyone thinks of a gold medal, but uh, the main memory I have is when we beat the Dutch in the uh, preliminary, pre preliminary game, which saw us go into the final with either a gold or a silver medal, so I think that was the most momentous thing. And so do I. It was great. Hard at the top, uh, Sandy? Yes, it's always hard, especially after 84, everyone thought, you know, just go away and we'll win a gold medal back then. And, um, we did a lot of soul searching, a lot of work behind the scenes with our sports psychologists and eventually the odd uh, paid off and um, eight years of hard work and it's all worthwhile. The men seem to be jinxed, what can you do no, about that? I don't know, I just don't know about the men, that's two years, well two Olympics in a row, they've finished fourth and they're a far better team than what their ratings show, fourth at both Olympics and yet they were probably, uh, well they deserve to win it more than what we did actually, the hard work that they put in. Mm. There's a Berlin trip in the offing later in the year. I think she'll make it because I don't think she'll be able to resist the temptation. Good luck to you, Sandy Thank Pisani. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you. A finals berth for reaching the semi-finals of the British Open and the final of the Paris Open. Squash star Chris Dittmar, represented by his father, Alan. Chris Dittmar has done well to again attract a Caltech nomination. Coming back from a career-threatening knee injury to once again put himself into the very top bracket on the professional squash circuit. If only it wasn't for a couple of Pakistani gentlemen called Khan. Chris was beaten by Jancha in the semi-finals of the British Open and Jahinga in the final of the Paris Open. He's our best by a long shot and not far from being the world's best. Well, that's true, but he's not satisfied with being number three, is he? No, he isn't, Tony, no. Just got to keep battling on and do his best. Now he'll be able to do that more readily because he's now headquartered in England. Yes he is, he's got a house in Brighton and bases himself there and uh, that's a springboard for the European 
circuit. Now he's beaten Jancher, as mentioned on the film, but he's still to beat Jahanga. Yes, that's right. Um, we just hope he can. I mean, he's, uh, I think he's got the ability. I just don't know that he's got the patience. That's, that seems to be the problem. But it was a question of fitness, but he's addressed that. Yes, he has. He uh, can't be much fitter than he is. And uh, I just get back again that I think it's just a matter of patience on the court. He's had plenty of good results. Yes, he, uh, he won the Australian. Um, played in lots of finals that didn't win any. Um, Grinstead? Well, he won that one, the East yeah. Grinstead, yes, in, in England. But he played in the final of the uh, New Zealand... Uh, Hong Kong, uh, Canada, US and, and a few others and, and just didn't, didn't get through. Yeah, but he's been terrific and, uh, you know, we recognise that. I mean, he's number three in the world. I mean, 80,000 others would like to be in that position. Congratulations to you, Dad. Thank you very much. You're giving much. the best for us. This lady returned from the Seoul Olympics with a swag of medals. Welcome home, Julie Russell. Olympic competition is the dream of many, a privilege for few. Julie Russell has been there, done that. At the Seoul Olympics for wheelchair athletes, Julie collected three silver medals in pentathlon, 4x400 relay and shot put, two bronze medals in discus and javelin. Getting to the Olympics is one thing, doing extremely well there is something else again. Did you go there knowing anything of your chances? Yes, well, uh, I'd been to the World Championships a year before in England, Tony, and there was a, an American girl who'd turned up there out of the woodwork who was extremely good, and I knew that if she came again, it would take a very bad day by her and a very good day by me for me to beat her, but that didn't happen. I had to settle for second. Now, no more pentathlons? No, that's right. Um, I've become a bit disenchanted with the track training, not enjoying it anymore, and I think once you stop enjoying sport, it's no point going on with it. Um, I've switched to weightlifting as my main sport now, and I'll keep up the field events because I'm still enjoying and improving in those. Weightlifting, do you mind? How do you do that in a chair? Uh, we don't. It's on a bench. We just do the bench press. That's the one lift that we do. And what kind of weights are you lifting? Well, I broke my own world record at the state championships on the weekend three times in the one up with 100 kilos. Are you teaching? <laughs> Isn't that marvellous? Are you teaching uh, Heidi or is she teaching you? Well, she's still ahead of me, but not by that much now, so... <laughs> Do you mind me asking, how did you end up in this uh, situation? I had polio, Tony, when I was uh, 16 months old, so... It took me a long time to get uh, started in sport. I didn't start until I was 27, so uh, late starter, but hope I'm making up for it now. Well, you are, and like Libby, a fantastic resolve and dedication, and how ironic, how, how tragic that today the world's almost free of it, and here we have this international rotary scheme which is guaranteed to rid the world of the, of the problem. Well, it's certainly a good thing that uh, if people do keep up with the immunisation program, that'll get rid of polio, but uh, I can't say that it's been all bad for me. Weightlifter, congratulations on what you've done. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Julie Russell. And she receives another highly prized silver statuette from Caltex and from our guest of honour in Barry Richards. For the second time in three months of the year in question, the voting was headed by a remarkable left-handed tennis star, who, like the rest of the tennis boys, is currently overseas. So here's a welcome to Mark Woodford's father, Ray Woodford. Mark Woodford has made a sensational impact in the past 12 months. The first South Australian player since Adrian Quist to win back-to-back -back South Australian Open titles. He performed with distinction in the last two Rio International Challenges. Woody played the match of his life against Ivan Lendl at Wimbledon, holding a match point before Lendl survived 10-8 in the fifth set. I watched him very closely in Melbourne, and uh, no doubt you did too, and as with Darren, I feel he's had too much tennis. Possibly at the moment he has, Tony. It's a um, pretty hard um, job to keep up into the top class level oh, for I'm weeks on end. Not minimising that, and he did so well here, didn't he? Yes. Now, 
you know, he's a kind of, he's a cut of a young tennis player that I like because he more represents the old style. Just get on with it and take the good with the bad. Right. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think that he's been brought up that way along the line. He's um, always applied himself to the game, had a name and kept his cool throughout and it's been very pleasing. Yes. We're pretty proud of him. And I understand it. And he finally got his RX-7. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Oh, well, he's very close friends with Darren, of course, and John being in the motor trade, Darren has had some pretty good cars, so he thought, well, we'll see what we can get. <laughs> but he, he went along and he got the RX-7 over well, last Friday week, and, of course, Darren and, and Mark, they've been driving around together and had a great time. And his aim is the top ten. Is that attainable? I think so. Um, I think the South Australians at the present moment, especially the young ones, Darren and... Mark have got a show of reaching the top ten. Um, they both have to be self-motivated and apply themselves to the job on hand. I think that's quite possible. Ray Woodford to Mark and we're all on standby as he is for the Gold Award. It'll be announced shortly by the Premier of South Australia. <laughs> as Ray Woodford collects for Mark his silver statuette, we thank our guest of honour for the evening, Barry Richards. All the best to you for the rest of your time in South Australia. Barry Richards, we stand by on the Celtics and uh, new Sports Star of the Year for the Gold Award announcement. Who's won it? I know who I think, but I'm not saying. In fact, only three people here really do know, and one of them is the sporting editor of the news, David Capel. And I ask him to hand that celebrated envelope to the Premier of South Australia, who will make the announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honourable John Bannon. Well, thank you very much, Tony. I'm. Uh not one of the three. <laughs> Just uh, before the moment, uh, to my uh, ministerial colleagues, Leader of the Opposition, um, all the distinguished guests and of course our sports stars, uh, I'm delighted to uh, be involved again with this presentation and must say uh, thanks very much indeed to Caltex, to the news and uh, to Channel 9 for televising the show because it really is a great opportunity for us here in South Australia to put on display the wealth of sporting talent we've got. It's tremendous to see the range of sports, ages, attributes and achievement that we see on this night uh, every year. And it's a great inspiration to all those younger aspirants in the various sports to get on with the job and really try and achieve the greatest. Uh, and uh, you know, a good uh, encouragement even to those uh, older ones that might be thinking of giving it away. Well, it's been a good year for South Australian sport, 1988. Uh, we had some great successes. We saw the achievements revealed. Uh, 89 is going to be pretty good too, I think, uh, particularly uh, looking ahead. There are a lot of carnivals and events, the uh, Masters Games, of course, here, and we're gradually assembling a range of venues that I think will make South Australia a sporting mecca. Well, without further ado, I've opened the envelope, I look at the card, and uh, she's here tonight, Lisa Martin. So Premier John Bannon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just really happy that for the third time winning this I can be here. My mum and dad and my sister have done a really good job for me in the past and I'm just really honoured considering the nominations and the finalists that we've had tonight that I should win. People like Sandy who has a gold medal and Dean Woods a silver and a bronze and I'm just really happy that I've been chosen. It is a great honour. 
I've been spending more and more time in Australia now. In fact, I consider Australia my base and the USA my part-time residence, which is nice. And I thank the news and Caltex for bringing me home because if they didn't, I'd probably still be eating chocolate with Rob in Phoenix and getting <laughs> fat. So it's great to be home, to be training. And I'd just like to thank you for this honour. And I'd also like to thank a few people who helped me when I was young because one of them especially is here tonight and that's Dr John Daly. When I was 14 years old, he trained me for 400 metre hurdles and he taught me a lot of attitudes that have carried me through the marathon and a lot of good habits that have helped me prevent ever having an injury, which is a rather remarkable thing. I think I hold a world record for lack of injuries. I'd also like to thank John Fry, who is not here tonight, but he was my coach at Enfield Harriers, and they were a club that I ran with when I was 11 years old, and I had great years running for them. I'd also like to thank my mum, dad, my sister, her husband, Rick, and my brother, Daniel, who've always given me great support. And I'd also like to mention for all the school children from South Australia who I've been still receiving letters from, congratulations for the Olympics. Some of them written in November, which I'm just receiving now. Just hang on, because I'm answering them all. And I just want you to know that it means a lot that you write. Thank you. Honoured lady, the first Australian woman to win a marathon medal at the Olympics. Hello to mum and dad and sister, you're all rejoicing with us. For the third time, the South Australian Sports Star of the Year, Lisa Martin. Tonight's telecast of the 1988 Sports Star of the Year Awards was brought to you by Caltex.